Hey guys, I'm looking at our 2.6 class notes and I'm not going to read these all to you. What I'd like you to do right now, honestly, is pause this video, read through all the notes, read through the worked out solutions. And if it all makes sense, great. You don't have to watch or listen to me talk. You can go straight to the homework and give it a try. If as you're reading, though, you find something looks a little weird, then come back to the video and fast forward until you see me talking about that part. So. I'm not going to be reading this all for you right now. I'm basically just going to be summarizing and getting to the examples and finishing the graphs. So a rational function, what we're talking about is graphs of rational functions. So a rational function is a polynomial divided by a polynomial. And we've already studied one very famous rational function, the reciprocal function. This was one of our basic functions, right? With x equals zero is the vertical asymptote, y equals zero is the horizontal asymptote, one, one, negative one, negative one, were our two kind of key points there. And a beautiful fact is any rational function that's a linear function or a linear polynomial over a linear polynomial can be rewritten and manipulated so that it looks exactly like a transformation of y equals one over x. Here's an example. y equals two over x minus three. Well, this, come on, it's two times my reciprocal function shifted over three, right? So that's, that's almost too easy, right? So there's my graph, right? Shifted over three to the right, vertical stretch by two. So instead of being one over one up from our intersecting asymptotes, I'm one over two up, hence the stretch one over two down by the stretch, right? Also, look at this example here as I move my face out of the way. Y equals four X plus five divided by X plus two. Again, you could technically use synthetic division on this and say, well, X minus a negative two, right? So negative two is my synthetic piece that I'm dividing by four, five. So bring down the four, that's gonna be negative eight. This is your remainder. So minus three over X plus two. Now what's the advantage of rewriting it like this? Well, if I swap the order of those terms, I've got negative three times one over X plus two and then plus four. That to me looks a whole lot like negative three times my reciprocal function being shifted to the left this time by two, right? And then plus four. So again, what am I doing? I am vertically stretching it by three and I'm flipping it over the X axis, hence the negative. I'm shifting it to the left two and I'm shifting it up four. So I can see my asymptotes very clearly. My vertical asymptote is coming from this denominator zeroing out, right? When X is negative two, my horizontal asymptote is coming from my shift up, right? So my shift up at four and three is the stretch. So instead of over one up three, in this case, it's over one down three because it's been flipped. And instead of over one up three, right, it's three, three. So we can see that beautiful um, stretch, reflection, shift, shift of my reciprocal function. Now, that is only true for linear over linear. So let's look at some examples that are not linear over linear. Oh, and then I probably also could have and should have said, you can find the vertical asymptotes, horizontal asymptotes, the limits, right? I trust you can all look at that and read that and make sense out of that. So um, another similar example, I probably should have left this blank for you to try on your own, but I didn't. So read through it. The only thing that might be confusing is how do you find a formula, right? You can figure out what these points are by their plots. You can look at, right, as X goes to negative infinity, oh, you're headed towards negative four and negative four if you're going to positive infinity. As you're approaching negative two, that vertical asymptote, clearly it's easy to see your vertical asymptote and your horizontal asymptote. So how would I find a formula for F of X? Well, again, these are my asymptotes, so I'm gonna be shifted down four and I'm gonna be shifted right two. So what's my stretch factor then, A? Well, use an ordered pair. You could use any of these ordered pairs, not that one because it's undefined. You could use any of these ordered pairs. Actually, I chose to use this one, right? So my stretch factor A, if I plug in three for X, three minus two is one. So that's just A minus four should equal negative six. That happens when A is negative two. So my function is negative two over X minus two minus four. 
which I would just leave like that. Or if you wanted to get a common denominator and rewrite it so you have a linear divided by a linear, you can get, do that too. But this is what's happening. It's a vertical stretch by two. We can see that it's opposite of what our reciprocal function normally looks like. So it's gonna be reflected over the x-axis, hence the negative coefficient there. Uh, shift right of two and a shift down of four, right? So let's now look at um, some examples where it's not a linear over a linear. So not every rational function, right? is transformations of the reciprocal function. But what we can do is we can focus on the intercepts, the discontinuities, and the asymptotes to help us um, graph a good sketch. So a couple things. So intercepts, again, the y-intercept, plug in zero. X-intercepts are when your numerator is equal to zero after simplification. So what do I mean by after simplification? Again, you might have removable holes, removable discontinuities when there's a common zero in the numerator and the denominator. If you simplify those away, you get a hole. Does that sound familiar from the beginning of the semester? Right? Vertical asymptotes are going to come from the zeros in your denominator that don't get simplified away. And then other asymptotes, so horizontal asymptotes are end behavior asymptotes. So horizontal asymptotes or a slant asymptote, sometimes called an oblique asymptote. Um, and then you could also just have asymptotic behavior. And so again, here's kind of an outline of what's happening when, depending on the degree of your numerator and your denominator. Again, you can always think about a power function that models by just taking the leading term over the leading term, but we're gonna wanna be a little bit more specific than just this. So we're gonna be doing some long polynomial division in a little bit. And the quotient, ignoring the remainder, this quotient part is the end behavior asymptote or asymptotic behavior. So again, let's jump straight into the examples to make sense of this. So this is Dr. Corder's how to sketch a rational function. This is how I sketch all my rational functions. Very first thing you wanna do, find the domain right? Find the domain restrictions. You do that by factoring your denominator, right? Wherever you have zeros in the denominator, you're going to have a domain restriction. They will either be holes or asymptotes, vertical asymptotes. So first, factor your denominator, right? And make note of your domain restrictions. Second, factor the numerator and then simplify, right? If it simplifies, those zeros are holes. So then make note, there is a hole at this x value, comma, and then how do you find the y value again? The y value is found by substituting the x value into that simplified function, right? And then what about all the rest of the zeros in your denominator? Well, those are now all your vertical asymptotes. So state the vertical asymptotes, right? x equals some number, right? That's a vertical asymptote. And then you're going to, since we're on the topic of zeros in the denominator, we just took care of those, let's find the zeros in the numerator, right? So again, the zeros in the numerator are all your x-intercepts, right? If you have a grid handy, plot them and note their multiplicity, right? Same thing applies with polynomials as it does in rational functions. If your zeros have an even multiplicity, they're just going to touch. If they have an odd multiplicity, they're going to cross, right? You also are then going to want to find the x-intercepts, right? If it exists, right? Assuming you don't have an asymptote at x equals zero, right? You're going to have a y-intercept. And then you've got some end behavior. So I'm going to toggle this back to blue because, again, end behavior horizontal asymptotes, if it exists, right? Asymptotes, I've, I've got blue, right? So you will either have a horizontal asymptote or a slant asymptote, which is a, a line, or an end behavior model function, some function that is getting at your graph is getting asymptotically close to as x goes to positive and negative infinity. So again, the best, rather than reading this all to you now, read it yourself. Think about it, and then we'll look at some examples specifically. All right, so in all of these examples, I haven't finished graphing it, but I've gone through this process because this is all something I expect you could do if you were to just read through these steps and kind of like follow this step-by-step -step procedure. So looking at our first example here, 
in example three, so looking at part A. Y equals X squared minus nine divided by X squared minus X minus six. So it was step one, find the domain. How do we find the domain? We factor the denominator. When I factored the denominator, I had X minus two times X minus three. So I, my domain restrictions are at negative two and positive three. So step one done, domain check. Now, do I have two vertical asymptotes? Do I have two holes? Do I have one of each? Let's keep going. Factor the numerator. Ah, this is a difference of squares. Oh, lo and behold, x minus 3 simplifies away. So what is my function actually equal to? x plus 3 divided by x plus 2 for x not equal to 3. Remember, when you simplify an expression, if you divide away a domain restriction, you gotta list that separate, you have to list it. So what does this mean? That means I'm gonna have a whole at 3. And then what's the y value? Plug 3 into your simplified function, so 6 fifths. So 3 and, let me actually go ahead and just rewrite this a little bit clearer. All right, so this is whole at 3 comma 1.2, right? 6 fifths is 1 and a fifth, so 1.2. And look, I plotted it right there, 3, 1, and a little bit more, right? So there's my whole. This also then means I've got a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 2. Ding, 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 ding. Graphed that right there. And extra bit of information. In the same way that zeros in your numerator have multiplicities, and those multiplicities, if they're odd, it means they cross. They go from positive to negative or negative to positive. Or if the multiplicities of your zeros in your numerator are even, then they're just going to touch. Right? They're not going to change sign. Similarly, you can think about multiplicities in the asymptotes in your denominator. So this is super advanced. I usually don't talk about this until calculus. But so you know, the fact that you have x plus 2 has multiplicity 1. Again, I'm using multiplicity kind of loosely here. Um, because it's odd, you want to think it changes signs, right? So as you're approaching this, you're either going to be going up on the left and down on the right, or you're going to be going down on the left and up on the right, right? It's going to be doing opposite things. Versus if this had a squared there, then it would be matching. It would be even. It would be symmetric about your asymptote, so to speak, right? They would either both be going up or both be going down. In this case, they're going to be opposites. Nice thing. All right, so check. Domain, check, right? We simplified and factored so we know where all of our discontinuities are. So this also tells us, right, we are probably going to have some range restrictions. More on that in a minute. All right, so domain, holes, vertical asymptotes. So since we've been factoring and looking at zeros in the denominator, let's look at zeros in the numerator, hence our x-intercepts. Our x-intercept in this case is going to be negative 3, right? x equals negative 3 is our 0, so x-intercept with multiplicity 1, so it's going to cross the x-axis at negative 3, 0. So I plotted that point. So I know I'm going to be crossing my x-axis, either going up this way or going down this way. We'll figure out which way in just a moment. And then my y-intercept, right? Plug in 0 for x, and you could do it here and get negative 9 over negative 6, which simplifies to 3 halves, or you could plug it directly into your simplified version and you still get 3 halves. And there's my y-intercept. All right, now, since the degree in the numerator is the same as the degree in the denominator, right, my, um, hores my end behavior is just the coefficient here divided by the coefficient here. So it's just 1. So I'm going to have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 1. Now, does the graph ever cross this horizontal asymptote? In order to answer that question, you set y equals 1 and y equals my simplified function equal to each other. So 1 equal to x plus 3 over x plus 2. Mm, cross multiply or whatever, right? x plus 2 is equal to x plus 3. Subtract x from both sides. 2 equals 3. No, that never happens. So the graph will never cross the line y equals 1. And thus, we can com confidently state the range restriction y is never going to equal 1 because it never crosses that horizontal asymptote and it's not going to equal 6 fifths or 1.2 because I've got a hole there, right? 
And what is my graph going to look like if I connect the dots quickly? What makes sense? Well, I'm going to be asymptoting this way. Uh, I'm going to be going up towards infinity because I'm not going to be crossing this to go back down.